scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, and you can find that in your New Testaments on page 54. So Mark 16, 1 through 8, page 54 in the New Testament in your Pew Bibles. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter and afterward Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation let us pray Lord you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades but your word endures forever now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Today's sermon is about coming out of the darkness and into the light. And after the past 12 months, I think that's probably something we can all relate to just a little bit. Last Easter, right around this time, this sanctuary was empty, perhaps for the first time in its over 100 years of history, while we watched each other on the other side of small screens, wondering if the world could possibly get any darker. And yet, even in the darkness, somehow, some way, that shining light of humor known as the dad joke still managed to thrive. Here are my top 10 favorites from the past year. Number 10, why do they call it the novel coronavirus? Well, it's a long story. Number nine, you never would have thought that the common, I wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole, would become a national policy, but here we are. Number eight, for those of you who had children during the pandemic, what will you call them 13 years from now? Quarantines. Number seven, my spouse purchased a world map and then gave me a dart and said, throw this and wherever it lands, that's where I'm taking you when this pandemic ends. Turns out we're spending two weeks behind the refrigerator. Number six, midway through the pandemic, the World Health Organization announced that dogs cannot contract COVID-19. Dogs previously held in quarantine were released. So, to be clear, who let the dogs out? Number five, speaking of dogs, a few months into the pandemic, our dogs were looking at us all like, see, this is why I chew the furniture. And number four is for literature enthusiasts. What's the difference between COVID-19 and Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. One is a coronavirus and the other is a Verona crisis. All right, this one, number three, is for those of you old enough to be fans of the British rock group Dire Straits. If you used your stimulus check to buy baby chickens, then that means you got the money for nothing and your chicks for free. Number two, 
Never in our lives would we have imagined a season in which our hands consumed more alcohol than our mouths. And number one, after years of wanting to thoroughly clean our houses but lacking the time, we finally discovered that that wasn't really the reason. All right. Today's scripture passage from Mark is, out of all of the Gospels, the oldest and the earliest version of the resurrection story of Jesus. And in the very oldest manuscripts of Mark, the story ends right there at verse 8, the end of our scripture reading today. There are no actual appearances of Jesus to the disciples, no great commission, and no ascension into heaven in the earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark. There is just an empty tomb and the slight glimmer of hope that maybe, maybe, the story of Jesus has not, in fact, come to an abrupt and tragic end. And I think that this is precisely the moment in which we find ourselves today. You see, in the past year, we have all experienced death and devastation. For some, that is the loss of loved ones or the loss of health or the loss of employment. For others, it may be loss in faith, loss of faith in our government institutions or leaders, loss of faith in human decency. We have often felt isolated in the past year, enclosed in darkness, sealed away in a tomb, as it were, and separated from all human interaction and contact. And I know many times, many of us hoped and prayed for some kind of resurrection, some kind of return to the life that we knew before. Now, with the arrival of a vaccine, with the lessening of some restrictions, there is a small glimmer of hope, and yet there is still so much fear and uncertainty, even now. Is it safe to come out yet, or is this just another false promise destined to end in disappointment and more darkness? I think there's great hope and light in our scripture story today for us and for our context now. Although, as is often the case with the scriptures, perhaps that hope is not exactly what we might imagine it to be or not in the way that we might wish or expect for it to be. Verse 1. When the Sabbath was over... Now, Sabbath, in Jewish thought, is a time of rest and introspection. It's not necessarily, and certainly not always, a time of peace or happiness. And so we might just as easily read, when the quarantine was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And the him in this case, of course, is Jesus, who is in the tomb. These three women, despite a great risk to their own lives, because Jesus and all of his followers had recently been declared enemies of the Roman Empire. These three women decided to go out and anoint him. They decided that their commitment and their love for Jesus outweighed the risk to their own personal safety. Now, was that a good decision? Was it the right decision? I don't know. These kind of decisions, as we have all learned, are highly personal. And the Bible certainly does not fault Peter and the other disciples who decided that it was not yet safe to go out. But Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went. Thanks be to God for those who venture out first, despite the risk that that entails, and may God watch over them and protect them in the process. Verses 3 and 4. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. I love 
the recognition on the part of these three women that they are utterly incapable of accomplishing on their own a very critical step in their plans. And I also love it that that doesn't stop them for a minute from moving forward and from doing what they feel is the right thing to do. Likewise, when we make a decision to honor our Lord and Savior above all others, I believe that God, even today, rolls away the obstacles to our plans and then changes our plans entirely. You see, these women never actually accomplished the thing that they set out to do, which was to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. But in their brave and selfless act of devotion, they were caught up in God's larger plan, which was not at all what they expected, but so much better. So as you venture out into the light, be bold in your plans, but hold on to those plans lightly, knowing that God always has a better plan. Verse 5. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the side, and they were alarmed. Now, we've had the benefit of 2,000 years of hindsight, and we know how the story ends. So when we read that passage, it's pretty obvious we say, oh, look, that's an angel. But there's nothing about this that would have necessarily signaled that to these three women on that first Easter Sunday. In the Greek language of the New Testament, young man here is, is neoniskos. And yes, that means a young man, but usually it means something a little bit more. It means a servant, sometimes a slave or an errand boy. Now, in Middle Eastern and in Greek culture, unfortunately, women are fairly low down in the social hierarchy, particularly widows and unmarried women like our two Marys in this story. But they're not at the very bottom. Aneaniskos would be even lower down on the social hierarchy. And so I think when we read that these women are alarmed, it's not so much out of fear because these are clearly three pretty strong-willed women. I'm pretty sure they could take down one small boy. But I think what that alarm is is confusion and doubt because this is not exactly an authoritative, reliable, believable person in their social circles. Verse 6, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to the Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. In the era of COVID-19, all of us have our own trusted, reliable sources of information. And that's great. Listen to them. But sometimes, it's also worth remembering that God speaks to us through unlikely sources, or even through complete strangers. Now, we shouldn't ever accept blindly what someone says to us, and the women in the story clearly do not. They run away. But we should always listen to what another has to say. Listen carefully to other voices. The young man in the story says, look, there is the place where they laid him. And we too should not be quick to discard valid evidence just because it comes from an unusual or unfamiliar place. Use the mind that God gave you, but always keep your mind open to other points of view and other perspectives. Herd immunity is good, but herd mentality can sometimes lead you over the edge of a cliff as your mama probably told you. Verse 8. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. That's all one verse. And so a few things in this verse First, 
they fled from the tomb in terror and amazement. Now, those sound like opposites on the surface, but I think they're two sides of the same coin. When we have lived in the darkness for so long, the light can be entrancing and amazing and also terrifying for us. I wish I could tell you today that coming out into the light is a simple and easy thing. Just do it. But I know that it's not simple and it's not easy and we all have our own way of approaching this decision in a faithful and intelligent way. Terror and amazement. Sometimes it's actually good to hold those two things in balance. And remember, balance means not letting one overwhelm the other. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome fled from the tomb. And this is interesting. They didn't say anything to anyone until they were in the presence of their faith community, people who shared their love for Jesus, people they knew cared about them and cared about each other and about the work that Jesus had called them to do. What is your sacred community? I hope it's this one. But even more than that, I hope you actually have one. Whatever it is and wherever it is, a community of people who both share and challenge your values, your thought processes, your reasoning, and even your reason for existing and your purpose in this life and in this world. Finally, we read that when all of that community, Peter and the rest of the followers of Jesus, and Mary and Mary and Salome, when they had all gotten on the same page, then and only then we read that Jesus himself sent out through them, and this is important because Jesus didn't just do it himself on their behalf, but he worked through them from east to west to send out the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. I want to leave you with this thought today. Where do you put your trust for salvation, for help? Is it in political parties? Is it in journalism and reporting? Is it in conspiracy theories? Is it in medical science? Is it in religion? Because all of those things that I just named have something in common, no matter how compelling they seem, and it's this, they've all frequently been wrong throughout history. They have all reversed course over and over again, and even though they are well-intentioned things and good things, almost all of them, they are all creations of fallible, finite human beings. If you put all of your trust in one of those things, you will be disappointed at some point. Now, we all know that this pandemic will ultimately and eventually end. I wish I knew when, but I don't. I do know that when it does end, all of the problems and all of the challenges that plagued us before the pandemic will still be with us. But the way I read the Gospel of Mark, the only thing that is truly imperishable, the only thing that can ultimately save us from ourselves and from each other and from any crisis we face, the only thing that can lead us out of darkness and into the light is the gospel, is the good news of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to love each other, to take care of each other, to give of ourselves to each other and for each other the same way Jesus gave himself for us. People of First Presbyterian Church, the stone has been rolled away. The tomb is empty. And we are afraid. We are amazed. But the sun has risen and a new day with it. Will you come into the light?